Thank you for joining this special ceremony to welcome Joe Watson, Jr. to the University of Georgia's Grady College as the inaugural Carolyn Cottle Teeger Professor of Public Affairs Communications. <laughs> special greetings to Carolyn, her husband Elliot Brown, her family, uh, and a special salute to Joe Watson, his wife Rachel, uh, his sisters, Benjamin, uh, we're just delighted that you're here with us. And let me also take a moment to thank the Teeger Professor Search Committee, uh, led by the great Dr. Brian Reber, right here in the back of the room. If you are involved in that search committee, raise your hand. Thank you, thank you, thank you. What a job you've done. And a special welcome to the Public Affairs Communications Advisory Committee, who just left a uh, spirited hour-long meeting with Joe, I think, in which we all left uh, ready to go enroll in his program. Um, if you are a member of the Advisory Committee, please stand and be recognized or raise your hand if you're in the back. Thank you all so much. It's a really special group of people who worked with us tirelessly uh, to make this professorship, a, uh, I think, a tremendous success. Also, special thanks to Bob Grafstein, acting dean of our great partner, the School of Public and International Affairs. Bob, where are you? There's Bob. Thank you, Bob. And to Don DiMaria, who leads UGA's Washington program, where Grady students tend to rule. Don? And of course, finally, when I'm recognizing people, the real reason we're here at the end of the day is our students. Yeah. Will the public affairs communication students please wave at us and stand and be recognized? <laughs> and investiture is a welcome, really. And we are here for this special event because of the vision, career, and generosity of alumna and public affairs communications veteran Carolyn Teeger. Carolyn, in many ways, will someday be said to have invented public affairs communications. She saw what students needed and put her heart, soul, and resources to the considerable grindstone of bringing great ideas to bear on a program and a curriculum at this great flagship institution and powerhouse for communications with a legacy of public affairs alumni leaders in public affairs communications, like certainly Carolyn, like Powell Moore, who's in attendance, like the great Earl Leonard, Tom Johnson. These people and the ideas behind them can and have moved institutions. And today we stand as the nation's first and only public affairs communications certificate program in the country. Carolyn committed a million dollars to create the Tiger Chair through her estate and get started for our students, gave 250,000 of that money ahead of time because she felt so deeply that we needed to get started building this public affairs communications program. She has worked with me tirelessly and I, I have to say at times shown tremendous patience in me as we built this program together. So I think for both of us, it's, it's a wonderful moment and a moment in which we, we see the fruits of our labor in many ways. It meant so much to have Carolyn with me during this process as spark plug, as a resource, as a collaborator, to shape and build the public affairs communications program and to build the wonderful model of the investiture ceremony to UGA. Carolyn's husband, Elf, established a professorship at his alma mater, the University of Vermont, which held an investiture program for the Brown professor. Today, we follow suit with the Georgia version. Elliot, we hope the Bulldogs and the Catamounts might someday collaborate. That was good. The life, career, and heart of Carolyn Teeger takes up that question in a profoundly generous and visionary way every day. What are we doing for others? As she does in the field of public affairs communications, in leadership, public service, policy, politics, advocacy, and communication for our democracy. Carolyn's career in D.C. is legendary, from Burston Marsteller to Porter Novelli and beyond. But rather than simply retiring from Washington to Naples, Florida, where she and Elle live, Carolyn just keeps on giving. She led the greater Naples leadership. Uh, when she stepped down, they had to pick two people to follow in her footsteps. <laughs> 
She serves on the action group for the Collier County Harry Chapin Food Bank. And she's as active as ever in public affairs communications. She led the successful campaign to get the mayor of Naples, Bill Barnett, reelected. Carolyn was also named to the Alzheimer's Foundation National Board very recently. And as the Sigma Kappas in the room, where are my Sigma Kappas? There they are. Uh, as those Sigma Kappas know, Carolyn gave a gift of $500,000 to challenge the sorority to successfully give $1 million to Alzheimer's research. And she still has Grady close to her heart. She wanted public affairs communications for Grady, and now it's the only program of its kind in the nation founded because of her. Carolyn, thank you. Thank you, and thanks to the committee for making this day possible and making it possible to welcome Joe Watson to our faculty. Carolyn. Good afternoon, Dean Davis, Grady Board of Trustees, and PAC Advisory Committee, distinguished faculty, Watson and Caudill, uh, family members, my wonderful husband, Elliot Brown, alumni, students, Sigma Kappas, and friends of UGA. I am truly overwhelmed this day has finally come to pass. It has been quite the journey. And guess what? We're only getting warmed up. I was 17 the day Daddy left me in a parking lot at UGA just down the hill from the J School. I had never been more excited in my life, but I was also riddled with anxiety. I would graduated from Banks County High School just up the road from here and was one of only two students bound for college out of a class of 72 graduates. I had a lot on the line, being the first generation in my family to go to college. While more than 50 years ago, I distinctly remember all the details of that day, especially what I was wearing. <laughs> <laughs> a yellow pleated skirt, a madras blouse, and a brand new pair of Weijin loafers. And for those students who are unfamiliar with that brand, they were really a hot ticket back in my day. <laughs> My daddy and my mama, who is no longer with us, wanted me to look the part, even though they sacrificed so much over the next four years to get me through Georgia. There was no hope grant back then, so my parents had to lease a small restaurant in Homer, and guess what it was called? Tiny Town Restaurant, of course. <laughs> they both worked there during the day, and my daddy, an almost 92-year-old, World War II veteran who is with us today went to his second regular job at night. They wanted me and my sisters, Debbie and Kathy, also a graduate and both are here today, to have a better life. Daddy went to great pains to keep track of how much my journalism degree cost and he presented me, he presented me with a grand total when I graduated in 1969. It was around $11,500 to give a buck or two. That was a substantial sum back then. That wouldn't even cover two semesters today. My Grady graduate nephew, Cameron, and my grandnephew, Gage, who's a junior at North, Co North Georgia, and Cameron graduated from Grady. Both of them can attest to that, I'm sure, given the price of everything today. While I started out in the College of Education, I soon realized that Grady was the only place for me and what a great education I got. So many wonderful professors, including Dean Drury himself. We didn't have computers or online exams back then. It was the old blue book essay method for the most part. It's horrible, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> One of the courses I enjoyed the most was public opinion strategies, which further fueled an already growing interest in politics. That interest actually began when Daddy and I literally started the Republican Party in Banks County. He was chairman, and yes, I was an original Goldwater girl, even though I wasn't even old enough to vote. After graduating from Georgia on one day, at the Sigma Kappa house, by the way, and getting married the next, much to my parents' chagrin, I left for D.C. to take a summer job. I caught Potomac fever, and I never came back, just to visit. 
Um, over the next 40 years, I held just about every job you can have in D.C. Executive Branch, Congress, the Reagan White House, two international uh, PR firms, and I owned my own company. Most of the work I did would be considered public affairs. I didn't lobby, but I did everything short of that to help shape policy, legislation, and political agendas. And while Grady equipped me with a solid skill set in public relations and advertising, I really felt like the first 10 or 15 years of my time in D.C. included a lot of on-the-job training when it came to public affairs communications. Simply put, I did not know enough about our government and how it works. I didn't know the elements of a great opinion editorial or advocacy ad or how to take polling results and turn them into winning messages or how to mobilize grassroots support on an issue on Capitol Hill. There is so much that goes into the art of making policy in this country. Many people say that it's like making sausage. You really don't want to see how it's made. But I truly, truly loved it. Democracy is not a spectator sport, and you have to participate in the game, sausage and all. So from my early conversations with, it, with then Dean Cully Clark, who thank you so much for being here today, and Parker Middleton, in 2007, to a lot of love, sweat, and tears, as Parker, who has been my inspiration, and I kept moving this dream forward to the arrival and advancement of the program, by Dean Davis and our PAC Advisory Committee, the most important pieces of my public affairs communications vision for Grady, the appointment of a professor, and the creation of a public affairs certificate program are today realities. But the heart of this program is really about our students and encouraging them to enter the world of public affairs communications. It is about our students who are interested in contributing to the future of our country. It is about those students who understand what freedom of speech and a democratic society are about. It is not for snowflakes. It is not for students who run to the streets or of safe space every time someone with a different perspective comes to their campus. It is for sharing ideas and learning from each other regardless of your politics. And it is, as Dean Davis said, innovative, the only program of its kind in the country. I truly believe this professorship in public affairs communications, which will become a chair upon my death, will equip Grady students, unlike me in my early career, with the skill set they need to hit the ground running as they enter the workforce. And now I get to do the best part of this program and introduce the inaugural Professor of Public Affairs Communications, a man I am so honored to have carry his new title, my family name, Caudell, and the name Tigre in memory of my little son. First of all, I would like to embellish on a Sherlock Holmes mantra and say unequivocally, there is nothing elementary about this Watson. <laughs> Joseph Watson, Jr. is an extremely accomplished and gifted man who was also the first in his family to go to college. Growing up on the south side of Chicago, Joe also had a lot on the line. But Joe, like me, had the support of amazing parents who stressed education and strong values to Joe and his two sisters, Sylvia and Veronica, who are also here today and were also instrumental in helping their baby brother chart his course. Joe's dad, Joseph Sr., the son of a Louisiana sharecropper, worked on his, da on, on his own dad's farm until he was 17. With only a second grade education, he made his way to Chicago and worked for the next 35 years in a steel mill for United States Steel. Joe's dad taught Joe Jr. his ABCs and his mom, Dolores, a Life Magazine telephone operator, is responsible for Joe's love of movies. They both told him he could be anything he wanted to be if he worked hard enough and they enrolled their son as early as second grade in gifted programs. Joe's dad, like mine, loved to talk current events with his son. And even though he was a Union Democrat, he voted for Richard Nixon in, 19, <laughs> in 1968. 
tragically, Joe lost his dad when he was 15 years old and just as he was starting to think about college in a really serious way. When Joe asked his mom about the college fund for his higher education, Dolores replied, what is a college fund? <laughs> After he got over that shocker, Mr. Resourceful landed a full ride scholarship to Bradley University in Illinois, where he graduated magna cum laude, of course, with a BA in political science. From there, he went to Harvard Law School, where he earned a JD degree, which he paid for with student loans, and I might say he paid them off in record time. So, with a Harvard Law degree in hand, Joe headed for none other than Washington, D.C. Is any of this sort of sounding like a parallel career path here? <laughs> <laughs> Joe spent the next 20 years steeped in public policy, politics, and advocacy campaigns. He served as a political appointee under President George W. Bush, where he led the Domestic Policy Office of the Commerce Department's National Telecommunications and Information Administration. Joe also worked on Capitol Hill, where he was legislative director for Senator Peter Fitzgerald of Illinois. It was during this time that Joe met his lovely wife, Rachel, also an attorney, and mom to their three-year-old, Benjamin, and I think she just took him out, but I hope she's in the back there. <laughs> in addition to his public service, Joe has extensive private sector experience running Fortune 100 Exelon Corporation's Government Affairs Office. There, he worked with Congress and policymakers on everything from energy policy to tax issues to trade. When we met Joe, he was leading Exelon's public advocacy group, a program he actually created. The program is known for its award-winning public advocacy campaigns on the value of nuclear energy, which achieved unprecedented legislation in Illinois and New York that supports the use of nuclear energy. So before Joe comes forward, I want to thank Brian Robinson for serving as our interim professor before jo Joe's arrival, and Chris Jones for representing the private sector on our search committee. The search conducted by Dean Davis, Tom Reichert, and especially Brian Reber, and his exceptional search committee was not an easy task. I am indeed grateful for the thought, time, and energy that went into the process, but most of all, I am thrilled with the outcome. There is no question in my mind that Joe Watson was intended for this job. As Einstein said, and this is something Joe and I have shared, God doesn't play dice with the universe, or with the university either, I might <laughs> add. <laughs> Where else could a little country girl who grew up in the red clay of Homer, Georgia, and a little boy who grew up on the south side of Chicago, both first-generation college grads, whose career paths almost mirror each other, and whose parents taught them the value of education, going after what you want, and giving back end up at all places but the University of Georgia. One with a desire to leave a legacy, one with a desire to fulfill one. Grady has chosen the perfect person to lead this effort. There is no substitute for real world experience when it comes to preparing our students. I am thrilled to have had the opportunity to help Grady launch this program and even more thrilled to hand it over to Professor Joe Watson. Well, I'm truly, with an introduction like that, you know, I don't know where I can go, but I have to say that I'm truly honored and humbled to be here and to carry the professorship that, bear, that bears Carolyn Caudell Teeger's name, uh, that of her father and of her son. Uh, it means the world to me. It is, not, uh, it is not a small thing in life to imbue something with your name, um, and it is not a small honor to bear that name. And Carolyn, I take the trust that you invested in me very seriously, and I will not let you down. Thank you. I'm reminded today of the end of one of my favorite films, uh, and if memory serves me, I think it's my sister Sylvia's favorite film, um, It's a Wonderful Life. And there's, there's a famous scene that we all know at the end of it in which George Bailey's life is celebrated by his friends and loved ones. And 
this investor ceremony is truly a celebration uh, of lives, um, both Carolyn's and mine, and it means the world to, to share that. And, and it, it's, it's unfortunate that in life we don't really have the opportunity to celebrate people when they're still here. And, uh, and I think by creating this professorship uh, and by the wonderful remarks here, I think we're doing that for, for Carolyn, for her father, who is a World War II veteran. Thank you, sir, for your service to our country. And, it, and in the spirit of George Bailey and It's a Wonderful Life, none of us would be in this room today if it wasn't for that gentleman right there. Yeah, right. So I have to begin with thanks. First, for Carolyn, again, for the honor to hold this professorship to the PAC uh, advisory committee that we just visited with for the wonderful search committee. Uh, Dean Davis, uh, the faculty, the staff, who are too numerous here, the members of the administration, just to put this room together. I mean, people don't think, it takes a lot of work to put this room together. People came here and did this work and we're grateful to them uh, on behalf of our families that you helped to make this day possible. It's a very special thing for my family, for Carolyn's family, and thank you for what you did to make that possible today. Um, my family, uh, I'd like to thank Rachel and Benjamin for taking this journey with me <laughs> to Athens, Georgia. Um, I, I say that, but um, uh, you know, it's a wonderful opportunity, but the truth is, you know, my wife really just doesn't like the snow that much. So, um, <laughs> so there, there is a bit of an ulterior motive with that. So um, I'd also like to thank my sister Sylvia and Veronica who are here with me today who've traveled from Chicago to be here and take time away from their work and their schedules. Um, they are two women that I admire uh, beyond words, taught me so much in my life and have always been there for me in a way beyond which I think average sisters are. They, they're very special sisters. Um, and great leaders in their own respects. They've taught me so much. Um, I would also like to thank some of those who are not present today, notably my mother and father who are no longer with us. Um, they, as Carol indicated, taught me so much um, and gave me literally everything that they had to teach. Um, they are not with us today, but they are here in spirit. And as Carolyn said, and she quoted at Einstein, you know, God doesn't play dice with the universe. I think Einstein was speaking of, that, of the laws of physics when he said that, but I, like Carolyn, take a more metaphysical interpretation. I think the connections that Carolyn and I have um, that brought me to Grady, that brought people of such different but yet similar paths together are not accidental or coincidental. Um, I, I think they are, they are preordained um, and, and a very special thing. And I also think that it's one of those things that in celebrating public affairs communications, it's really what makes America such a great place, um, that people, from such modest and humble beginnings can have the opportunity to excel um, and be entrusted with such responsibilities. And, and folks, there are students here, and I'm always gratified to see students present for events. You know, there you know, are parents here as well, and there's nothing that you take more seriously than who you entrust your children to or their education to. That is also a very special responsibility and one that none of us here take lightly. And so it means a lot that um, to the parents, you've entrusted your children's education to us at the University of, of Georgia, um, and it's a very special thing, and so we are all happy to be here and happy to be part of that, but part of that education really entails getting to know different people of different backgrounds, different belief structures, different political persuasions, and talk in a free and open fashion about those things, um, and that's what makes us great. That's what allows us to, uh, to foster relationships um, I, I think I remarked when, during the search process about one of my closest friends. Um, I grew up on the south side of, sh of Chicago. He grew up uh, in, in Macoupin County, Illinois, in western Illinois. He grew up on a, on a cattle ranch, um, and he's from a very rural background. Um, and you know, he did agricultural issues, I did energy issues, and right now he is the floor director for Senator Mitch McConnell. Um, in the Senate, and I couldn't think, Senator McConnell couldn't have someone better than, than my friend to do that, um, but we're wonderful friends, and you would never think, I certainly would have never thought, being a little boy, that I would have a friend like that, that would be a lifelong friend to me, um, but that's what makes America such a special place, and bringing people together the way that our country does and the way the University of Georgia does uh, is truly remarkable, and it's another part of your education beyond just the education that you learn derived from your classes. Um, 
but as a child and a young person, you know, you know, I, I caught the political bug at a very young age, uh, and I would often debate. My sisters would laugh. I would often debate uh, my father on issues of the day, and we would have these. I was, I was the, believe it or not, I was the liberal view in that in that household um, on issues, and I would t would take these. We'd have these debates about issues of the day, um, and I know Carolyn recalls having similar experiences and discussions with her dad, who's here. Um, and I can say, a as a child and young person doing that, I never dreamt that I would be able to do it professionally, um, let alone be entrusted to instruct others in doing it. And so I am delighted to be here to do that and to fulfill the vision that Carolyn has uh, for the professorship. I was often asked during the search process if I would really come to do this. Um, and it was a question that always surprised me because Athens is a wonderful place, University of Georgia is a wonderful place. Um, I can think of nothing better to do with the remainder of my career than to be here and work with the wonderful faculty who are accomplished and world renowned, as well as the wonderful students who grow smarter and smarter every year, who are far smarter than I was when I was, when I was in your shoes as a, as a, as a college student. And so it, it's really an honor to be here with you guys. Um, but kidding aside, I'm really here because I care deeply about the future of our nation. Um, as I know you do as well. And I believe we need to do everything we can to encourage the best and the brightest to pursue careers in public affairs, communications, and to equip them with the skills that they need to be successful. You know, I could not have arrived at a more interesting time when I came to the University of Georgia. We had the Georgia 6 congressional race, the hottest congressional race in the country going on here. Um, and I had, you know, there were, there were several students involved in, the, in my classroom, in my advanced public affairs communications class, that are working on different, different uh, candidate campaigns. Um, and so it was really remarkable. It was a real laboratory, uh, you know, for us to discuss these tools in that real world context. Um, we've had Sean Spicer's tenure in what is to be, you know, everyone would agree, the toughest job in communications, White House Press Secretary. Um, and it's tough, and there are real teachable moments to be derived from his tenure in, in that post and talking about that and talking about the issues and how they're being approached. Uh, and it's important to talk about those things. You know, just because you don't like President Trump is no reason to not talk about what he's doing or what he's doing right or wrong, and, and the same is true for the other side of the aisle. We have to talk about issues. We have to learn the best approaches, the best tactics if you want to be able to succeed. We are here to prepare you guys to go out and follow your passions and advocate for the causes and candidates that you believe in. And you can't do that by, uh, by, by being selective in, in who whom you learn from. You have to learn from everyone. Um, and uh, we also had, you know, issue advocacy ads happening during the Super Bowl that were, were nationally discussed. Um, and it almost made up for my beloved Steelers not being in the Super Bowl. Um, so there have been a lot of good teachable moments. Uh, but they all underscore this, this, this central point. And navigating the world of politics and policy in this new media context and landscape um, that includes social and digital media as well as traditional print and broadcast media, it's not easy. It's very complicated, um, and there's not a lot of people that are adept at doing it. You know, we are fortunate at the University of Georgia to have alums um, that have gone out and done this, like like Carolyn and others. But they're they're a rare commodity. Um, but because of the complexities of policy and importance of policy to shaping our country, uh, there's just an increasing demand for these kinds of professionals. Um, these are people who manage communications to ensure that their client's message gets out um, and manage opposition to that, op that, that messaging and push back that, that comes when you're trying to work an issue. Um, there are people who work for candidates. There are people who work for public officials, for corporations, for trade associations, for non-governmental organizations. Um, the the skill set that public affairs professionals bring to the table are essential to success in this new world. And the University of Georgia, in taking the path that Carolyn, the dean, the faculty, and others have charted, have really embarked on an ambitious program to jumpstart the preparation of the next generation of those campaign and public affairs communications professionals. I, you know, I have to say that it's been often said that it's the first program of its kind in, in, the, in the nation, and it truly is. And the interesting thing about that when I talk to practitioners is it's one of those things like all great inventions where they said, why, why hasn't anyone done this before? You know, I, why didn't I think of that? 
you know, where Carolyn did think of that, and, and we're all fortunate because, because she did, and because the University of Georgia embraced that vision and has established this program, we believe this program is really going to be groundbreaking. We, we think others will follow suit with what we are doing here today um, and the work that we're doing in conjunction with the School of Public and International Affairs um, to offer the certificate program, which is just one aspect of the broader public affairs communications program that we've embarked on. Um, as the first Carolyn Caudell Teeger Professor of Public Affairs Communications at the University of Georgia, um, the post that established by Carolyn's vision and generosity, I have the honor to teach and mentor the next generation of public affairs communicators at one of the nation's leading journalism and communication schools, and to do so at a time in which everyone recognizes the importance of communication skills to our nation's future. Um, our students will be stepping into these roles sooner than we may think. Um, and I think anyone who spent time on Capitol Hill will probably be, sh if you haven't, you'd be, sh be shocked by the youth of the people that are, that are, that are making decisions on war and peace and, and the judiciary. Um, no, by the way, one of my favorite moments was when I was a young lawyer, I practiced law and I made an argument before a judge in the Northern District of Illinois. And she gave me, gave me a really hard time in getting a motion granted to transfer venue in a case, pretty routine motion. Um, but I got the motion, but it was, she really, you know, it was a real rigmarole to get, to get it done. Um, and a few years later, I was a young Senate staffer um, and there's something called a blue slip that senators have to sign to make nominees go forward. And this, this uh, woman appeared before me as a, as a, as a, a nominee for the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. <laughs> and uh, she walks into my office and she says, and, and keep in mind Capitol Hill is a small office, not a little, it's not a stately office. She walks into my office, she's like, Mr. Watson, I granted your motion. <laughs> And I, I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I said, you sure, you sure did, you know? Um, and she was, and, and by the way, she would go on uh, to be the first black woman to, to serve on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. And, um, and she was a phenomenal jurist, um, and, uh, but it just goes to show you where your past may take you. And so there are a lot of young people who do this. Our young people are gonna have remarkable careers and we believe our program is gonna help them to get there faster and to be better in their careers. We have a lot of work ahead of us to make this program, and we all know it can and should be. But I'm incredibly excited to be here and beginning this journey with all of you. Abby Page McCann to come here. <laughs> Callie. And we do have men at, at the University of Georgia, too. <laughs> every once, I don't know how I have, but every once in a while. So, Thomas. Uh -huh. 